In 1866, 19-year-old Charles W. Jackson decided to pursue ledger writing for the Army. He was an educated man. However, he lacked proper writing skills. Charles received a ledger as a gift from his father, Charles McClintock Jackson, in hopes that this would help improve his son's writing abilities. On October 1, 1866, Charles began writing in his ledger about events in his everyday life. Charles writes in the ledger for three years, telling stories about life at sea, experiences in New York, and the people closest to him. The ledger ends with Charles' last entry in Nebraska on May 1, 1869. At this time, his family was tricked out of much of their savings, so Charles and his brother Walter decided to move to Virginia in hopes of making a new life for themselves. As Charles' journey ends, a new chapter in the ledger begins. It is unknown how the ledger made its way into the hands of the Cheyenne Indian tribe. However, they began telling their own story in Charles' ledger. The Cheyenne Indian tribe drew stories of tribal history, including hunting buffalo, trading horses, and battling for their lands. Around the 1880s, Othman A. Abbott was starting his career as a lawyer in Grand Island, and as a form of payment, he received the ledger. He did not value it at the time, however, Edward W. Arnold, a former Indian scout and registrar for the United States Land Office, explained the significance of the ledger. The ledger remained with the Abbott family until 1988 when it was donated to the Sturm Museum. The following are excerpts from the ledger, which you can see in person at Stur Museum. Friday, October 11th, 1867. Between the hours of 2 and 4 o'clock, the third mate sang out to brace around the crash jackyard. I was about to catch hold of the brace when Jack Holton told me to catch hold of the top sail braces. He then struck me ten or twelve times and hurt me so much as to make blood come and called me whore bastard and several other vulgar names. I sang out to the third mate and asked him if he allowed him, Big Jack, to strike me in that way. The answer he gave me was, serves you right. Between seven and a half o'clock and eight o'clock this morning, Big Jack looked and his face hid in the looking glass and found that it had been cut. He then, in a very cowardly manner, struck me in the face and cut it very badly and told me he would kill me yet for proof and have the whole catch there turn around to the crew and called every one of them the most vulgar names he could think of. February 1st, 1868 Received $7.50 from the Erie Railroad Company. I hope and trust that I will improve in my writing so that Mr. Davis would be sorry to have me leave. But I am very much afraid that I will have to leave as my writing is very poor and is not fit to be put in army books. But I hope and trust that I will improve more and more every day so that I will not have to be discharged. If father is willing, I would like to go to writing school three times a week and take lessons and see whether I cannot improve more in my writing so that I will be fit to write an army person's book. Monday, January 27th, 1868. Went into Eli's room and took his brush and soap and also one of his razors and shaved myself clean. Clay came after me after lunch to go to the deck again. I went down there with him and went over to Mr. Davis's office and show him my handwriting. He asked me if I thought that it would improve. I thought that it would. He told me that he would take under these terms if I did not improve, he would give me my walking papers. I hope and trust that I will improve in my writing so that he will not be moved to discharge me because it would make me unhappy and make father angry with me. Therefore, I will endeavor to my all I can and become good. Wednesday, March 25th. I asked Father for one dollar and he gave it to me. I went to see the play, Humpty Dumpty. I liked it as far as it went, but I was very much disgusted with the dancing. Page 48. I am tired of lounging and doing nothing or else get something to do in the city 
New York and receive enough to support myself. Monday, June 1st. Walter got his back up this morning and would not speak to me all day. I don't care if he does not speak to me for the next three months. I will not speak to him until he speaks to me. If it does not make any difference, if he never speaks to me again, I can enjoy myself just as well. I gave up smoking today. I hope I will be able to keep from it. Thursday, July 2nd. I stopped taking lunch today. I also went to a new place this morning. My salary is very small, $5 per week, but I would rather work on a small salary than stay at the mill and not get anything. I only hope that I will please them so that they will raise my salary so that I can support myself without hanging on to father anymore. I received from father $16, five he gave to me to spend on the fourth, seven to pay for my shoes and four for Walter. He had not spoken to me yet. It will be a good many years before I speak to him if he does not speak to me. Tuesday, July 21st, 1868. I had a little squabble with Lizzie about my seat at the table. I told her that I wanted to sit with persons of my age. When that informal, saucy Big Mary spoke up and said that she did not care where I wanted to sit, I had to sit where I was. The next time that she gives me any of her lip, I will give her a piece of my mind, which she will feel for a few days. I will keep quiet and sit wherever they feel inclined to put me until my board falls due. Then I will try to find board elsewhere. I think that if I was Aunt Sarah, I would keep my mouth shut as tight as I could, as she only puts her mouth in people's affairs when she ought to keep it shut. I think Aunt Grace ought to show W and I more privileges than other boarders, as they have a room six feet by ten feet and have to pay eighteen dollars per week when Eli has a room of that same size and pays only six. Aunt Sarah and Arthur pay four dollars and fifty cents per week apiece. I will not waste time and paper writing about it, but wait until my board is due, then try to find somewhere to board where it will be cheaper. The less board I pay, the better for my father. I would only have to pay $6 per week. It would be much more in his pocket. Tuesday, November 3rd, 1868. I was up at 6.30 this morning and put in my vote for Grant and Colfax for president and vice president. Ate my breakfast and went downtown. I have been pretty busy all day, but not so busy as I was yesterday. I shall try to get up early now and take a walk every morning before breakfast and keep at it unless it's raining. I have a way of putting off getting up until the very last moment. Monday, November 30th. Received from my father $12 toward my board. I paid Aunt Grace $23 and will pay her the other dollar tomorrow or the day after. I want a little money and I do not like to draw the first day in the week, therefore I postpone it until the middle of the week, wherefore if I draw today, I will spend it before the middle of the week, and if I don't draw it until the middle of the week, I will have the dollar bills. Father was speaking to Mr. Hotchkiss about raising my salary. Mr. H said he could hire a boy to do the work I do for less salary because my work is light and trifling and anyone is capable of doing it. H said if I could write a good hand, I could obtain a situation anywhere and be able to obtain a good salary. I will endeavor to do everything to write a good hand and get a, as good a salary as I can and get out of the clutches of the old man. Then I can use my stamps as I please and do as I please, and I will not have anyone to be running to the old man telling him lates saying Charlie went here, Charlie went there, Charlie did this, Charlie did that. I don't care if they do. Nearly all my aunts run and tell father everything I do. I cannot move without someone running to tell Aunt Susan everything I do, and she will tell father, and he will bark and bite at everything. I have not been up to Aunt Susan's for over a month. The reason for not going are because she tells everything she knows. Tuesday, December 3rd, 1868. Intended to write every evening after dinner and try to improve my handwriting so that I can get off father's hand as soon as possible. But I have had to run after Walter every evening and take him something to eat to keep him from starving. Aunt Grace has taken him back and gives him board and lodging for nothing. I only hope that he will try to get something to do and try to do everything he ought to do and do it willingly and cheerfully 
and not grumble when he has to do things he ought to do, as he generally does, as he has a terrible temper, and when it is once kindled, it is worse than a rabid dog. He thinks because he is under age, father is bound to support him in every idleness, but he is very much mistaken. He is very fond of dressing and likes to attend other things instead of attending to his duties. If he expects people to support him in idleness, he is very much mistaken. I always gave him my lunch to keep him from starvation and would rather suffer myself due to hunger. I only hope that he will repent his past follies and endeavor to strive to become a man. He thinks it is big to dress well and look nice, to have a cigar in his mouth and stand in front of hotels, look at people and go by and say to himself, I am better than most. Friday, December 25th, 1868. I laid in bed until 10.30, then went downtown and made out the list for tomorrow's collections. This is the way I spend my Christmas. I thought I spent last Christmas bad enough, but I have spent this one a great deal worse. Saturday, December 26th, 1868. I learned through Father that I have to leave my present situation for what I don't know. Father tells me it has something to do concerning paper. The only thing I know about paper is that I have sold the old waste paper and selling and appropriating it to my own use. If I had thought for a moment that it was stealing, I would never have taken it. I thought I had a perfect right to take the paper and use it as I wished, but I little thought that for a moment I was doing wrong. If I have to leave, I have, so there is no use in making a fuss over nothing. I received ten dollars from several brokers for a present. Monday, December 28th. I got, as expected, my walking papers. Mr. H. told me that I could have him as a reference. He also gave me one dollar, which I had to lose. I have money to pay for my board until next Friday week, and when that is gone, I will have to go to sea. I shall go and see my father after dinner and see what he has to say. Tomorrow I will try and obtain something to do. It is not like it was when I was lounging about before and had father to support me. I will go about asking everyone if they want a clerk, and when my money is almost played, I will go to a steamship because I will try to get on board of them and see if they will take me. Wednesday, January 20th. I was in hopes that I might be able to get a flute tomorrow, but it is just as I thought it would be. Father is not willing, therefore I will have to content myself with my piccolo this winter and do the best I can without a flute until I am able to get one. I am in hopes that the gold brokers will adopt the instrument I now have charge of into their room by a large majority and give me enough money to take care of myself so I will not have to be running to father for everything I want as he always says no to everything I ask him. If I get the situation, I will pledge myself that I will do everything I am told to do and make myself as agreeable as possible. And let them see that if I take interest in working the instrument, if Mr. Hotchkiss only keeps to his word and gives me the handsome present he speaks of, I will be able to get the flute and make myself as happy as any person would wish to be. On the other hand, the majority will go against it. Then I will be knocked into a cocked hat and will have to go back to sea and follow it for a living. If Bill is discharged, I still stand a little chance to get a place, but I'm afraid. Oh, Father, would that it were to our Heavenly Father that I never had been born to go through all the trouble I have gone through within the past few years. I am not fit for anything except to do boys' work and nothing else. I have tried everything and not been able to get along nor be of any use. What was I ever made for? I cannot do anything. I cannot write a hand worth looking at. So what earthly use am I? Or what was I ever? No one can tell. I am sure that I cannot. Saturday, April 10th. W and I have joined a colony that is intending to start from some western land and buy up several hundred acres. I am in hopes I will go in a week or two, but I fear I will not go at all, as the old man will not let us go at present, as they have not any land picked out for us. Saturday, May 1st. When I wrote the above, I expected to live in Nebraska long before this, but I think the society is a fraud and have squandered the money. 
We, with a few others, were thinking strongly of seceding from a colony and going to Virginia and settling there. You have just heard some readings from the Indian Plains Art Ledger, and we're going to have just a small discussion right now with Samantha Stump, who is the curator who's primarily responsible for... What did, I don't know, what did you do? You translated, or you uh, transcribed the ledger. Yeah, um, so part of the um, issue with the ledger was that Charles' handwriting was really, <laughs> really bad. As we've heard him say over and over again, it's like, oh, my mm -hmm. handwriting's terrible. Yep, um, <laughs> it's true. It was all in cursive. Um, That's and funny. it often switches back and forth between being full cursive to shorthand to um, other aspects of whatever he was doing at the time. And then, of course, on top of it, you've got the, the Indian Plains art. That, right. Yeah. yeah. And so some of it um, is impossible to read because it's covered with the beautiful pictures that the Cheyenne did. So his handwriting was bad. Yes. And <laughs> did it get better? Did it get worse? Was it consistently um, bad? <laughs> you know, for a while, it's pretty consistent. And then you do start to see some improvement in what he's doing. It gets a little bit easier to read when we're getting toward the end of the um, the ledger. But So his handwriting did actually get better. Yes. <laughs> That's pretty funny. Um not a lot, though. Not mm -hmm. enough to be in the army, which is part of the reason that he does kind of give up on um, being a ledger for the army. Um, his father starts deciding that they're going to move to Nebraska. They've got a plot of land that they've already paid for with promises that when they get there, there's already going to be a town there. They okay. get here and there's, there's no town. There's... Um, land laid out, but there's expectations that when the settlers get there, that they're going to build the town instead. Huh. So their their whole party has squandered their money um, and don't so, know what to do. They decide that they're going to that they're going to go back to Virginia without their dad because he wants to stay with the party and and like cut down trees and build. Build a settlement. Yeah, well, he's he's going to be stubborn about it, and huh. you know, like there's nothing left. They so, have nothing. So let's back up just a second. So who was this guy? I, you get the impression with the ledger that he was a maybe a a, a little bit of of a child of privilege. I mean, at no point he, he talks about not liking having to be uh, working or having to take money from his dad. But at the right. same time, the ledger is just stuffed with, took $18 from dad today, took $12 from father today, took $32 from, you know, that sort yep. of thing. Yeah, so, he, so tell us a little bit about who he was. Well, um, it's apparent that he had an allowance system going right. on with his father, but he didn't know how to keep his money either. <laughs> like, he, he talks about buying a pocket watch out of a catalog. He talks about buying a flute out of a catalog and, and trying to learn to that flute. trying to learn to play that flute and kind of totally failing at it. But I think he thought with that one that he could have another skill that would be helpful in the army. And his officer that he kept going to, or not officer, he was much higher rank. I can't right, right. I can't think of the rank right now. He goes, no, there's <laughs> it's not gonna work man um that's funny like but he does keep trying and i'll give him that on it yeah um so yeah. let's ask real quick so he and then of course his family comes to nebraska he turns tail and runs his father did his father stay i believe his father stayed they talk the last entry in the journal um talks about him and his brother walter getting ready to move to virginia um, whether their father comes or not. Um, there's nothing after that that states what happened. My assumption would be that they had to trade everything away for um, money or supplies, and he ended up trading away his journal. Yeah, which is a fascinating story. So it's in the hands of this kid. It gets mm -hmm. traded away for just supplies. Yep. When they're in a dire situation, the uh, 
what tribe is it? I'm sorry. The the, the Cheyenne. The Cheyenne. Get hold of of the ledger at some point. Mm-hmm. Just turn it into this amazing. Do you have any insight as to why they would do, why they would draw on top of this ledger? I think it was a fascinating thing to them. Yeah. Um, to get a hold of paper that it works so much differently than whatever they're used to drawing their pictures on. Right. And so paper is so much easier to draw on. Um, and they paint in these beautiful uh, browns. Yeah. Um, and depict exquisite stories. So it was kind of a novelty almost. Yeah. It's like, I've never drew, drawn on paper before. Let's do our art yep. on top of this new thing. Yeah. Huh. And on almost every page they used. And it's amazing. It is. So, and then, of course, they trade it to O.A. Abbott, mm-hmm. who is one of the one of the big names in, in Hall County uh, No, history. actually, they, they trade it to uh, another man who uses it as payment for O.A. Um, oh, that's right. As a, uh, his first job as a lawyer. That that is so it's used as payment. He gets mm-hmm. hold of it, and then it ends up at Stewart Museum a hundred yeah. years later. Yep, that is amazing. So is so to wrap up real quick. Is the is the ledger currently on exhibit at Stewart? Um, it is not currently on exhibit right now, but it was for um a couple of years, and then it will be again once it's rested properly. Sure. Um, do you mind if I tell a couple stories from no, the ledger? Hit it. Okay. There are a couple odd things that Charles writes about. Um, Mm -hmm. One being that his brother had a very severe temper. Mm -hmm. And his brother would, he'd blow up and then he'd disappear uh, for months at a time. I think the longest time that it states that he's disappeared is about a year. Wow. And then he comes back. Um, There are entries about like I said, buying uh, random things out of catalogs and enjoying them for a little while and then kind of giving up on them. Mm -hmm. He talked about life in the army and how he's treated on the ships that he's on. I read one of those where he got got in a fight with some bigger guy and it did not go well. it did not go well. And he seemed to be the punching bag of most of the guys on the ship. Um, he also seemed to be kind of the butt of some jokes. Mm-hmm. Um, they would play really mean pranks on him, and then he would get in trouble um, from his higher officials. Um, he talks about going to a play. In yeah, uh, Humpty Dumpty. Humpty Dumpty in, yeah. uh, in New York. And how he... Um, he liked the music, but he didn't like the dancers. He thought that their outfits were too scantily clad. <laughs> um, yeah, it's it's such it's such a weird thing because he's. I mean, you imagine his upbringing is somewhat puritanical, mm-hmm. but you know, a young man in the army, you think maybe that's the kind of show you. I don't know. <laughs> well, you never know. You know, um, I I do think that. He he went to the theater a lot. Hmm. He was he talks about going to shows, but he doesn't name them typically. Um, he just says, you know, I paid ten cents for a ticket down at the theater and went to a show, and then he moves on to something else. Yeah, um, that might have been part of his money problems. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> He yeah he doesn't seem to know how to budget very well. Um, he pays the rent a lot, mm-hmm. um, but after the rent is paid and whatever he has left over, he pretty well spends it all. Yeah. Um, he talks about visiting uh, a lady friend, and just kind of hanging out in her apartment for a while and then leaving. Like he doesn't say that they had a conversation. He just seems to have sat in her apartment until he left. <laughs> not normal, not normal 1890s courtship. No. It's just <laughs> yeah. Well, and I, I'm not even sure that it was any kind of courtship. I think oh, he was sure. just visiting a friend. Huh. Or it could have been anything else. You never know. Um, he does have a point that he talks about in the journal where he says, 
he starts in on saying something and then he cuts to a code that he's written in Greek. And then he says, and I'll never do it again at the end of that. And I have not been able to translate what he's talking about. Huh. Um, but it was definitely something he didn't want anyone to find out about. That is fascinating. It is. A code in Greek. Yep. Huh. Well, and it it seems to be in Greek and translated, or Spanish translated to Greek or something like that. Huh. It's a very odd kind of thing. Um, so I have no idea. And so it's just, it's a fascinating thing that yeah, you get to see so many layers of somebody yeah. from so long ago yeah yeah huh. yep all right so we're we will put that back out once it's properly rested could you explain real quick what that means and then then we'll wrap it up um artifacts need to be rested for a period of time they need to not be in the light for a while so it will go into an acid-free box um, it will be wrapped in an acid-free tissue paper so that nothing leaches into the journal and it is able to just sit and be and not ha we don't have to worry about it deteriorating. Um, it will be in a temperature-controlled environment right. as well. All right, excellent. Well, this is a fascinating piece. Thank you for taking a couple minutes to talk about it and good work on the on reading uh, reading his handwriting. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.